To have a lot of bipartisan work done. And maybe we start with infrastructure. But what are the odds? Republicans and Democrats. Work done. And maybe we start with infrastructure. But what are the odds? Republicans and Democrats can find common ground. We hope the future will be different. And our Republican friends realize their legislative. We'll spend the hour with our Sunday panel. Bruce Melman, Marie Harp, Michael Needham, and Mo Alethe. We'll spend the hour with our Sunday panel. Bruce Melman, Marie Harp, Michael Needham, and Mo Alethe. Goid epidemic. We'll find out the state of the nation's most pressing crises. All right now. Goid epidemic. We'll find out the state of the nation's most pressing crises. All right now. We begin with breaking news. The protests in major cities across Iran, including the capital, where college students and others, angered by the country's worsening economy, are challenging the government in a way not seen since the Islamic Republic's disputed 2009 presidential election. President Trump has tweeted his support of the protesters and has sparked pushback from Iran. Let's go live to Steve Harrigan in West Palm Beach, Florida, for the latest from the Winter White House. Steve. Dana, the protests across Iran, clearly a focus for President Trump. He has tweeted about them for the past three days in a row, including just minutes ago, drawing attention to the demonstrations and showing his support for the protesters. The president tweeted, many reports of peaceful protests by Iranian citizens fed up with regime's corruption and its squandering of the nation's wealth to fund terrorism abroad. Iranian citizens fed up with regime's corruption and its squandering of the nation's wealth to fund terrorism abroad. The world is watching. Those remarks drew a sharp response from Iran's foreign ministry, read out on state control. The world is watching. Those remarks drew a sharp response from Iran's foreign ministry, read out on state-controlled television, saying, Iranian people give no credit to the deceitful and opportunist remarks of U.S. officials or Mr. The protests, which have spread to cities across Iran, began over anger at higher food prices and food shortages. But the anger has expanded to target the Islamic regime itself and the supreme leader by name. On Saturday, President Trump retweeted a portion of his address. Oppressive regimes cannot endure forever. It is hard to tell where the protests are heading. But as their scope has gotten wider, so too has the intensity of the crackdown, which has seen arrests, tear gas, water cannons, and now shots fired, and at least two, which has seen arrests, tear gas, water cannons, and now shots fired, and at least two protesters killed. One thing that is clear, no matter how these protests do develop, is that this president will not sit by silently on the sidelines. And this just in from Iran state TV. The government has at least temporarily shut down Instagram and the Internet messaging app Telegram. Dana, back to you. All right, Steve Harrigan in West Palm Beach. Steve, thanks for that. President George W. Bush. Former DNC Communications Director Mo Alethe. Marie Har, former State Department spokesperson under President Obama. And Michael Needham, head of Heritage Action for America. Um, right before the show, President Trump tweeted again about Iran. Take a look at this. He says, uh, let's see if we can pull it up here. Yes, big protests in Iran. The people are finally getting wise as to how their money and their wealth is being stolen and squandered on terrorism. Looks like they will not take it any longer. The USA is watching very closely for human rights Looks like they will not take it any longer. The USA is watching very closely for human rights violations. Michael, let me start with you. What do the protests tell us about what's happening inside Iran? And does the fact that there are these protests, for perhaps as unorganized as they are, but they are growing behind the regime because he had been tough about Iran and threatened to decertify the Iran nuclear deal. It certainly does. And as you mentioned a month ago, the New York Times had done a big story headline saying that, that President Trump was uh, unifying the Iranian people behind their regime. That's clearly not what's going on. These were protests that started. Trump was uh, unifying the Iranian people behind their regime. That's clearly not what's going on. These were protests that started um, over some economic issues, the price of poultry and eggs. But clearly, it's about much more than that. It's about terrorism. Uh, they're saying death to Hezbollah, exactly the types of 
uh, things you need to see going on in Iran for a, ch a change in the behavior, if not the actual regime. Um, all that said, you have an extraordinarily powerful regime. It's a regime that's powerful with more of the region uh, that it is set up. And so uh, the protesters certainly are up against a very powerful regime. That's where the United States can come in, help provide them uh, with access to the types of secure communications they need to go forward. Uh, Ambassador Haley could do something symbolically at the UN uh, to show. And really, we need to put pressure on our European partners uh, to step up. It's pretty embarrassing right now uh, that all these kind of post-nationalist human rights European partners uh, to step up. It's pretty embarrassing right now uh, that all these kind of post-nationalist human rights defenders in Europe are completely silent when you actually have people standing up for themselves, standing up. Video of um, women who are being very brave uh, in particular because of the crackdowns that they have to go through. Bruce, how important is it for the United States to consider helping on this issue of being have to go through? Bruce, how important is it for the United States to consider helping on this issue of being a Instagram, Twitter, other social media? And it's also how Western media finds sources and gets information. You know, it I guess I have two thoughts on that. First, we've got to be careful. We too often in these kind of conversations make the rest of the world's politics all about us. Mm -hmm. Is this about them supporting Trump or hating Trump or mm -hmm. supporting Obama or not? And the reality is this reflects a, uh, a population's unhappiness with a repression Obama or not. And the reality is this reflects a, uh, a population's unhappiness with a repressive regime that's not delivering positive economic results. And in some ways, is uh, rather than the global terrorism, the type of growth for the for the nation and the type of freedoms for the nation that people want. That also explains Brexit. It's a lot to do with the election in 2016 here. With respect to shutting down technology, people often forget the Internet and all of these social media applications are neither good nor evil. They are forces that can be used for great good and encouraging population or uh, in problematic ways to crack down on people. Mm -hmm. Just for great good and encouraging population or... Uh, in problematic ways to crack down on people. Mm -hmm. Policy of the United States becomes we're going to weigh in on the domestic politics mm -hmm. of other nations around the world, getting involved through technological means. Mm -hmm. Boy, that sounds a lot like something a former FBI director is spending time looking at. Well, that, and sort of, I, I worked on the Broadcasting Board of Governors for a mm -hmm. while, and that, the attempt was to try to get people the access that they need. Marie, let's go to your expertise. I mean, there's no secret that part of the storyline here in America, as we, of course, focus on ourselves, <laughs> is that um, there's comparing President Obama's mm -hmm. reaction or lack of support for protesters in 2009 to what you see from President Trump and Pence and the rest of the administration today. Is that criticism fair, or do you look at it and think that it was circumstantial and different back then? Well, I think that fair, or do you look at it and think that it was circumstantial and different back then? Well, I think that as we're looking today in 2017, almost 2018, the United States has to walk a very fine line here. It will be protesters of being Western lackeys, U.S. lackeys. That does not help their cause. So while we should, and the president did say the world is watching, we should stand with people standing up to repressive regimes. Mm -hmm. There is a fine line here because if the goal is to make sure these protesters actually have space to express themselves, the United States weighing in on their behalf stronger than, you know, some people wanted us to do the press themselves. The United States weighing in on their behalf stronger than, you know, some people wanted us to do that in 2009. The reason we didn't was because it was our judgment. And we were hearing from Iranians protesting on the streets that your support will not help us. And so that's the line the Trump administration has to walk here. And I hope they continue to look at it from that from that perspective. Mo, this is um, and it is a regime that is racing towards becoming a nuclear power with capability to wipe out any city in the United States, as they say. Um, is this a race against time if China and Russia are not going to fully cooperate? Uh, I think so. I think so. Um, Russia are not going to fully cooperate? Uh, I think so. I think so. Um, there's no question that China is really the key here. That they will, uh, that they have more leverage on North Korea than almost anyone else. Uh, Russia needs to play an important role here, and if they slow down, uh, a lot this past year we've seen a lot of back and forth with with this administration, and in the best way to deal with it. I think it, uh, now looking back on the first year of the Trump administration, and in the best way to deal with it. I think it, uh, now looking back on the first year of the Trump administration, I don't think the tone that the president has set uh, 
was as successful as he thinks. More on China and on Russia, getting them to step into the very important roles that they need to play. Um, because otherwise, we are headed on a very dangerous trajectory. Michael, President Obama's handling of national security issues played uh, in large part in the midterms of 2014. Uh, do you see that as a big part played uh, in large part in the midterms of 2014? Uh, do you see that as a big part? I'm not sure that national security will be number one or number two on it, but people should look at this and say we finally have a president of the United States with a coherent national security strategy where he's taken all of the different things he's talked about uh, about America first and put it into the context of a coherent national security strategy. We finally have an Iran strategy that's about more than just cutting a deal with Iran on the nuclear issue, but is dealing with the fact that they are striving to be a regional hegemonic power. Uh, we have a real policy towards North Korea. I think, as most says, it needs to be stronger to get the Chinese to engage. And during the first term of the Bush administration, we put secondary sanctions on a bank in Hong Kong, Banco Delta Asia, that really had uh, an impact on the behavior of the North Korean regime. We need to be doing that again secondary sanctions on, on there's 12 Chinese banks uh, that um, so that could be targeted. Mm. Uh, but we finally have a coherent national security strategy, coherent engagement with the rest of the world that is making us safer. And if you look at this at the end of a national security strategy, coherent engagement with the rest of the world that is making us safer. And if you look at this at the end of eight years of the Bush administration, the world was safer for America. At the end of eight years of the Obama administration, the world was less safe for our country. And I think we're well on the trajectory right now, and people should keep that in mind in 2018 and beyond. 17, and uh, the administration points to the fact that they're quite diminished, not only just in territory, they say I think 98% of the territory is diminished, Bruce, and that their fighters are out, but the cybersecurity threat, or the, and, and also the online recruitment mm -hmm. of terrorists by ISIS, is that something you're going to be looking at in 2018? I think everybody has to look at that. There is a threat not only from ISIS, but around the world. The internet has empowered more people, created more economic opportunity, and been better for the world than any prior technology. And it also creates greater vulnerabilities and greater threats than any prior technology. Uh, we're brilliant at connecting and creating those opportunities and pretty inept at defending ourselves and defending our allies around the world. A lot's going to have to change, and hopefully it can change before something really bad happens. Indeed. All right, panel, we have to take a quick break here. When we come back, the effort to avoid a January federal shutdown and what is on the to-do quick break here when we come back? The effort to avoid a January federal shutdown. And what is on the to-do? We're going to pick up where we left off and get back at reforming health care. We're going to get back at reforming these entitlements. And we're going to take on welfare reform, which is another big entitlement program. I'm going to reform, so I would not expect to see that on the agenda. House Speaker Paul Ryan and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell somewhat at odds over what to tackle next as part of the Republican Party's agenda in 2018. And we're back now with the panel. Michael, let me start with you. After a rocky several months on the legislative front, the Republicans pull it together and they're able to leave with several accomplishments. They point to economic growth and uh, the regulatory rollback, uh, judicial appointments, the fight against ISIS, and now the tax bill, so, uh, the regulatory rollback, uh, judicial appointments, the fight against ISIS and now the tax bill. So I'm wondering if at this point, as you look back on the year, is the Republican civil war sort of coming to an end? Of, uh, a, of you know, position within the Republican Party. I mean, I think part of the reason that Donald Trump of, uh, a, a, of you know, position within the Republican Party, I mean, I think part of the reason that Donald Trump uh, got elected was he recognized that the Chamber of Commerce agenda that the Republican establishment in Washington likes to fight for um, isn't actually what people across the country who are anxious need uh, wisdom, uh, which not only keeps able-bodied people out of the workforce, which again hurts growth, uh, but is a complete attack on the human flourishing of uh, people being able to go in and find self-worth self and uh, and dignity. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the types of policies that we need. That's different than what the Republican Party, which loves to come to town and work about and worry about insurance programs for, uh, you know, for companies or the export import, come to town and work about and worry about insurance programs for, uh, you know, for companies or the export import bank or the typical agenda of the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. So I don't think the Republican Civil War is over. We need to come together. Tim doesn't care about them. But Mo, a lot of Republicans, I think, are thinking at this point, they're like, well, even if they felt like the populism strain of the Trump campaign wasn't something they could go for, that, that actually the agenda that they could largely agree on, especially when it comes to tax cuts, wasn't necessarily what they thought would uh, happen at the end of this year. Largely agree on, especially when it comes to tax cuts, wasn't necessarily what they thought would uh, happen at the end of this year. 
to carry them into successes in 2018 or even in 2020 if they don't have a coherent message and, and accomplishments of their own? Yeah, there's, there's two parts to a successful campaign message, right? One is, um, you know, uh, when you're the party out of power, making the, the, the aggressive case against the party that is in power, but you've got to offer an alternative as well. And so Democrats do need to offer some sort of an agenda. Now, I will say this about 2017 and the Republicans in Congress. By every measure, you compare this first year of this administration compared to the first year of the four previous administrations, two Democrats and two Republicans. They got far less done, far less done legislatively in, this, uh, in 2017 than the, his four predecessors did. The one big thing they have to hang their hat on, the tax uh, bill at the end of the year, is could not be less popular. Uh, in, in the eyes of the public. But that could, that could change now, with the that, economics that play could, out in their favor. Sure, that could change. But historical precedent of something that big, public opinion shifting as aggressively as it would need to before the midterm elections, there's not a lot of precedent for that. The big thing they'd say they want to do now is infrastructure. But you can't even get the House and, Repu uh, House and Senate Republican leadership want to do now is infrastructure. But you can't even get the House and, Repu uh, House and Senate Republican leadership on the same page on this. Yeah, they certainly so, they have work to do. Yeah, so there. they have a lot of work to do. Bruce, it's difficult to cast 2017 other than um, an economic success story. And the stock market rose every month. Uh, of the year, which is the first time that's ever happened. Uh, the last two quarters had 3% GDP growth, something that um, in the last decade we were told that might not actually be possible again. Um, and then their accomplishments and electoral successes through, through the economy still. Is it still the economy? Well, look, uh, nothing matters more to voters than the economy. I think that's the single best predictor, whether it's 2018 or 2020, what's the economy look like? And if you've got peace and prosperity, you tend to do well as a teen or 2020, what's the economy look like? And if you've got peace and prosperity, you tend to do well as a party in power. And if you don't, you're challenged. Uh, I also think presidents get more credit for economic or for Republicans either in 2018 or 2020 or for the uh, Republican policy successes is just look at the economy, therefore we did that. Mm -hmm. But I do think uh, Mo is a little unfair. I think th there have been a lot of Republican accomplishments we didn't talk about in areas such as energy and areas such as labor policy. A um, lot of Republican accomplishments we didn't talk about in areas such as energy and areas such as labor policy. Um, it was a, a big fourth quarter push, but a whole lot got done. And a lot of that was done administratively. Uh, Marie, uh, leaders are going to go to the Speaker's office on Wednesday when yes. they get back into town that, because they have. Uh, Marie, uh, leaders are going to go to the Speaker's office on Wednesday when yes. they get back into town that, because they have a lot to do. Um, they're going to get together on the third mm -hmm. of the month. On the eighth, I think, is when the House or the Dreamers, mm -hmm. um, as both sides have said that they want to do that, but how they will do it is still a question. And they have to figure out a way to not shut down the government. Exactly, and they have to get a budget passed. And I think a lot of these have to figure out a way to not shut down the government. Exactly, and they have to get a budget passed. And I think a lot of these have proposed blowing through the budget caps that a Republican-controlled Congress put in place to control spending. Whether it's DACA and immigration, I think there is a bipartisan uh, way to get an immigration. Whether it's DACA and immigration, I think there is a bipartisan uh, way to get an immigration fix to DACA with some funding for border security, possibly an end to diversity visa. But there's a question about paying for it, whether it's infrastructure. You know, there are conservative deficit hawks not running again, like Bob Corker and Jeff Flake, that I think are not going to be sure things in the Senate. The Republican civil war over this issue of deficits will continue to grow. If you want to do infrastructure, if you want to do this large budget issue, but this is going to be the big fight. How do we pay for everything? We can't keep writing these huge checks. Well, and Michael, I see you nodding your head in a way. It's like, well, um, it seems like whenever parties are in power, uh, the deficits don't matter. Uh, yeah. When they're out of power, exactly. the deficits matter a lot. But from the deficits don't matter. Uh, when they're out of power, exactly. the deficits matter a lot. But from the pr perspective of um, conservative Republicans or even like the House Freedom Caucus, are they going to continue to stuff? It's uh, even during the Obama <laughs> years, they just pretended for partisan reasons to be uh, out of uh, to be <laughs> just, it's uh, even during the Obama years. They just pretended for partisan reasons to be uh, out of uh, to be <laughs> that when you have uh, budget caps that have been put put in place by Republican Congresses, uh, those should be respected. I think they need that when you have uh, budget caps that have been put put in place by Republican Congresses, uh, those should be respected. I
I think they need to be rejiggered to allow mm -hmm. uh, our defense to, to be funded the way it needs to be funded. Uh, but it would be outrageous to, I mean, to see that out of the Republican Party. I don't think there's any chance that you get an immigration bill done by January 19th that actually solves our nation's immigration problems. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to have an immigration system that makes sense where you bring in the people that you should be bringing in. That's not what we have. It's because of chain migration. President Trump has been absolutely clear that he will not sign a dreamer bill that doesn't deal with chain migration. The idea that people, when they're left into this country, yeah. can bring relatives uh, with them. Distant relatives. Distant relatives. We should have a system that allows people to come into this country because they can contribute to this country, because they can assimilate to this country. That's what needs to be changed. And yeah. the president is correct to require that to be part of any deal that happens. Well, do you think that they will be able to reach an agreement, President Trump, uh, the Republican leaders? But Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, when they were with the president in the summer, he seemed to think that you know, there could be some common ground there. Yeah, I, I think everyone is still hopeful. But it, it, what we've seen, in, I think, since that meeting... Uh, is a lot of people gearing up for midterm elections mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, really rolling up their sleeves and, and tackling the issue. I think gearing up for midterm elections mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, really rolling up their sleeves and, and tackling the issue. I think the, the the easiest point of entry here, the one thing that everyone seems to at least say they're on they're on the same page on, are the dreamers. Mm -hmm. But because of everything else and all the other political kids become mm -hmm. the pawns. Although they're not all kids anymore. I that's think. I fair. Think people that's get frustrated fair. That's fair. That, that, no, no, that's, that's not fair point. Um, fair point. pointed out. All right. Uh, thanks, panel. We'll keep it right here, please. Up next, how will the new tax law impact the upcoming midterm elections? Will Republicans be able to keep control of Congress? We'll take a look at some of the key races when we return with the panel. Uh, they're going to be hotly contested, and uh, nothing should be taken for granted by Republicans, and certainly nothing should be taken for granted by Democrats. They need to also put their best foot forward. That's Alabama Senator-elect Doug Jones, who will be sworn in this week on the impact of his surprise election on the 2018 midterms. And we're back now with the panel. Bruce, let me ask you, historically, we know what happens in midterms. The president in power often loses seats. That's almost always the way it goes. Who's most likely to win in the midterm elections and who has what hand? Uh, well, it's a Who's likely to win in the midterm elections and who has what hand? Uh, well, it's a great question. Uh, on the Republican side, there is uh, their districts, there's demography and dollars. Uh, thanks to gerrymandering, most Republican districts are very safe Republican. They're generally not a threat of losing to a Democrat. True, or it wasn't midterm. Uh, but midterm elections are always uh, older. They're always uh, more white. They're always more conservative voters. Uh, and Republican Party committees and super PACs have outraised their Democrats. They're always more conservative voters. Uh, and Republican Party committees and super PACs have outraised their Democratic counterparts. That said, uh, the single best predictor for a midterm typically is the president's popular. Mm -hmm. uh, you can gain seats. Mm -hmm. This president's at 39 percent. Historically, mm -hmm. they would lose 33 seats, which is enough to lose the majority. Uh, similarly, with Democrats, they have a massive enthusiasm advantage. The M NBC M uh, Wall, Wall Street Journal poll said 49 percent of Democratic and lean Democratic voters are very enthusiastic versus 34 percent of Republicans. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that professionals tend to look at are the so-called generic, would you rather mm -hmm. would you see Republicans or Democrats, Democrats control Congress? And right now, Democrats, it's a year out, but are sitting on an epic 13-ish point lead in that. Uh, so uh, so uh, history so which hand not... would you rather play with? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Answer honestly. Uh, I, as a rule, it's more fun playing the insurgent hand anyway. Uh, certainly 2010 and 2014 were fun. Um, so uh, as a Republican, it, I'd probably want to play the insurgent hand this year. Let me ask you, Mo, um, if you could look at this graphic here. We have the Senate uh, toss-up seats. Um, these are the ones that uh, everybody's sort of looking at. Um, Nevada, Arizona, Missouri, Minnesota, Indiana, West Virginia, Tennessee, maybe even uh, North Dakota. If you were working uh, or advising Democratic senators in red states, how would you advise them to approach this upcoming election? Because this is where President Trump won bigly. Yeah. Um, the president's success in a lot of these battleground states was because, and, and you know, I'm not a fan of, of the president, but I give him credit for recognizing that we are in a populist age. And so his rhetoric was very populist. I would encourage any Democrat, whether you're in the suburbs or whether you're in one of these, or one of the states up on that map, to urge any Democrat, whether you're in the suburbs or whether you're in one of these, or one of the states up on that map, 
to between people and and the elites. Uh, and so, to, if you can go into these states between people and and the elites, uh, and so, to, if you can go into these states and talk about the the need to for people to have a champion in Washington. It's that, that you had up there, he's on his his popularity is underwater. You can go after him where it makes sense to, but the other side of the equation is to offer them something as an alternative. If that alternative is, but the other side of the equation is to offer them something as an alternative. If that alternative is a champion, a true champion, then I think Democrats are going to be in a very very good position. I would much rather have the Democratic hand than the Republican hand this time. The president's numbers are. Underwater, this close things are are a nice setup for Democrats, but Democrats have to close the sale. And if they can do that by showing that they will be a champion for people who feel disconnected from the establishment, mm -hmm. then I think it's going to be a very good year for Democrats. Marie, well, do you think the, that the, the mm -hmm. data back mo up as well? If you take a look in off-year elections, the party out of power has won 110 out of 114 since 1982. 110 out of 4, 114 mm -hmm. Senate elections. Um, in off-year elections, and the party in power, it's 96 percent, the party in power is 104 out of 128, that's 80 percent. Mm -hmm. Marie, what about this, uh, he talked about the Democrats having a lot of enthusiasm yes. behind them, especially with a little bit of a turn you saw, at least in Virginia and Alabama, mm -hmm. yep. that's not obviously going to <laughs> make, the, make or break the case for right. 2018, but that suburban women voting for Democrats and a big turnout for African Americans. Do you think that that kind of energy can sustain itself through 2018? I do. I think that there's a couple of places to look. You're right, suburban women and suburban men uh, who are getting frustrated with the Republican-led Congress, with President Trump, also looking I mean, you see that in Virginia, you see that in Pennsylvania as well. Independents are another place to look. Independents are now increasingly by double digits saying they would rather vote for a generic Democrat than a generic Republican. Republican Party self-identification is at the lowest point since 1991. So all these numbers say that we're going to have a Democratic wave, but Mo is right. Democrats need to close the sale. And I think what the party is looking at doing is finding candidates that fit their districts, not having litmus tests across the board. This is not a national election. This is about district by district. This is about state by state. Mm -hmm. And the fundraising on a candidate level, Democrats are doing historically well in fundraising at the individual level, not at the not party at level, the party which level. is a challenge for 2020. But in a 2018 election, that's less of a challenge We'll see if Democrats can close the deal. Michael, let me ask you about this. So Bill de Blasio is going to be sworn in again um, as New York City mayor. As a and New Yorker, this depresses me. I, I, I'm a New Yorker now, too, and I was born in Wyoming. Um, so uh, four years ago, he was sworn in by Bill Clinton. This week, he'll be sworn in by Bernie Sanders. Does this talk, does, what does this tell you about the shift in the Democratic Party and any advantages do you see there for Republicans? Well, I think at its core, the Democrat Party has a far greater challenge than the Republican Party. The Democrat Party has a huge divide right now from its kind of hashtag left, which cares about an issue matrix that is just gigantically different than the issue matrix matrix of the rest of the country and they care about climate change and they care about LGBTQ issues and, and that is about half of the, of the Democrat Party right now versus a still working class part of the Democrat Party uh, that feels and, and cares about a lot of the same uh, issues. David Winston just did a great uh, uh, report for something called the Voter Study Group looking at this uh, that cares about jobs, that cares about the fact, as Mo was talking about, that many people in this country feel like our nation's elites have kind of moved on from caring about America and caring about their struggles and are more kind of cosmopolitan elites who want to be well accepted at Davos. Yeah. Uh, people around the country who feel that Washington is corrupt. The Democrat Party has a divide. I don't know how they're going to bridge it between these two very powerful blocks uh, within it. The Republican Party has the challenge of recognizing that we're not in 1984 again. We have to do uh, elections differently. We have to talk about different issues. We can get there pretty easily on our side, showing how our same conservative principles can work for today the same way they did during Ronald Reagan's time. I don't know how you square the hashtag left and Lena Dunham uh, with the kind of traditional well, we have the perfect class. person to ask right here on the panel, Mo. Can the Democrats win back working class Democrats, um, sort of the, the voters that had voted for Obama but decided to vote for President Trump this past time around? Uh, I think they can. And I think, you know, look, both parties struggled with it in 2016. Both parties, you know, Donald Trump. Past time around. Uh, I think they can. And I think, you know, look, both parties struggled with it in 2016. Both parties, you know, Donald Trump defeated the Republican Party before he defeated the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Both parties became very disconnected from the working class. And so I think uh, Democrats 
though I, where I would disagree with Michael is that there's this huge, if you can call them that, are really more of a matter of degree than a matter of direction. They do still fight for sort of the same thing, how they get there and what tone. There is one, one faction that's angrier than the other. Um, but you compare that to the fissures within the Republican Party, I, I'd still rather be trying to harness, you know, shepherd the cats in the Democratic Party than herd the cats in the Republican Party, mm -hmm. um, where they seem to be all over the map right now. There's a great opportunity on the legislative agenda to expose this fissure. With where they seem to be all over the map right now. There's a great opportunity on the legislative agenda to expose this fissure with all of the regulatory hurdles to actually doing infrastructure projects, it's impossible to get that money out the door. What but it Republicans is possible should that be President doing, Trump could help on that front from the well, regulatory standpoint. That's standpoint. exactly what they should do. Is that this infrastructure bill? It Republicans is possible should that be President doing. Trump could help on that front from the well, regulatory standpoint. That's exactly standpoint. what they should do. Is that this infrastructure bill needs to be about actually making it possible to do infrastructure projects. And if you do that, you drive a wedge right in between the labor unions and the and the workers of the Democrat Party yeah. and the environmentalists in the Democrat. Party. Party. It's going to be a huge We focus a lot on Congress, but if we talk about what actually impacts voting, redistricting will happen again in 2020. And who wins governor's uh, yes. mansions in 2018? Yes. 36 governor's races, That's and Democrats right. have nowhere to go but So, up Bruce, there. if you've been a donor to either party, <laughs> should you turn off your phone for the next few months? Uh, <laughs> yes. If you, uh, you haven't turned off your phone as a donor, <laughs> something's wrong with you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, panel. We have to take a break there. Coming up, the impact of the Russian investigation on the White House in 2018. President Trump says he thinks special counsel the impact of the Russian investigation on the White House in 2018. President Trump says he thinks special counsel Mueller is going to be fair, even as some Republicans raise allegations of political bias. The special counsel investigation into Russia's in The special counsel investigation into Russia's investigation appears to gain steam. The New York Times, citing unnamed officials, reports Australia may have raised the red flag, prompting the FBI's investigation. Former campaign advisor George Papadopoulos allegedly told one of Australia's diplomats that Russia had thousands of hacked emails that would hurt Hillary Clinton months before WikiLeaks published them. President Trump's lawyer, Ty Cobb, released this statement. Out of respect for the special counsel and his process, we are not commenting on matters such as this. We are continuing to fully cooperate with the Office of Special Counsel in order to help complete their inquiry expeditiously. And we're back now with the panel. I think expeditiously is what everybody would like. Uh, Mo, how important is the piece that the New York Times ran yesterday? And does it add an additional piece to this puzzle that the investigation may have originated before the Steele dossier was ever in play. Yeah, one of the big questions... Investigation may have originated before the Steele dossier was ever in play. Yeah, one of the big questions that had been unanswered up till now was what got this whole thing started? Mm -hmm. What was the impetus behind the investigation? And you had Trump supporters uh, blaming the dossier and, and, and Papadopoulos popping off while drunk in a bar <laughs> to uh, Australia's top diplomat, Nick Papadopoulos, popping off while drunk in a bar to uh, Australia's top diplomat and top intelligence partners, uh, calls the FBI, you know they're going to take it seriously. So I think this is a big deal, and, and prop intelligence partners uh, calls the FBI, you know they're going to take it seriously. So I think this is a big deal and, and provides some much needed and important context to where things are. Then, let me read to you something that President Trump said to the New York Times. say Marie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to you next. I just uh, had a panic attack. Um, there was tremendous collusion on behalf of the Russians and the Democrats. There was no collusion with respect to my campaign. I think a collusion on behalf of the Russians and the Democrats. There was no collusion with respect to my campaign. I think I'll be treated fairly. Time I mean, wise, I can't tell you. I just don't know, but I think we'll be treated fairly um, from Republicans who are trying to undercut the investigation. Absolutely. And I think that uh, campaign to undercut Mueller's credibility has had an impact. But in 2018, the proof will really be in the pudding. The campaign to undercut Mueller's credibility has had an impact. But in 2018, the proof will really be in the pudding. Wrong. But we've already had new information uncovered throughout this investigation about what, what Russia was trying. Wrong. But we've already had new information uncovered throughout this investigation about what, what Russia was trying to do, about contacts with the Russians during the campaign. And I think that Bob Mueller 
Mueller will continue pulling on all of those threads into 2018. Mm -hmm. And if, as the Trump campaign has always said, the Trump team has always said, and if they really are innocent, as they say, I think the American people deserve that. Michael, what about the president's point? He says that the collusion was actually between the Russians <laughs> and the Democrats. Is that going to go anywhere? Well, I mean, the one he says that the collusion was actually between the Russians <laughs> and the Democrats. Is that going to go anywhere? Well, I mean, the one thing we know is that the DNC hired Fusion GPS, uh, which then hired Christopher Steele to put together this Russian dossier, and it relied on at least two high-ranking members of, of, of the Kremlin. Uh, for some of the information in it. And so that is the one thing that's come out this year uh, that we know with a reasonable amount of certainty happened, and it was coordination between the DNC through Fusion GPS with Kremlin officials. Um, and so that's something else. With all of this, we are better off kind of waiting, letting this investigation play out. Um, kind of every month, new stuff comes out and it trickles out. That's not the context. The American people deserve this investigation. They deserve it to play out fairly. Mm -hmm. They deserve to know what happened. And we are best served by waiting uh, to get all the facts. We saw certainly in during the Lewinsky scandal as well. Um, but take a look at this um, sound between two congressmen, uh, Rooney and Bass, if you could play that. <laughs> I would like to see the, the directors of those agencies purge it and say, look, we've got a lot of great agents, a lot of great lawyers here. Those are the people that I want the American people to see and know the good work's being done. The type of purges he's talking about harkens back to the Cold War when, when there was a, a purge by McCarthy to find communists that were hidden in the federal government. So, Bruce, what I'm wondering about is that regard, no matter what Mueller decides, um, have the people already made up their minds that the system is corrupt and they're, they're, it's, um, have the people already made up their minds that the system is corrupt and they're, they're either going to think that Trump did something bad or that he never did anything bad and is that just the way it's going because it's becoming so politicized? Because um, facts still matter a lot mm -hmm. but uh, when you and I were talking about this year and my observation that I think 2018 is going to make 2017 seem tame one of the reasons is and my observation that I think 2018 is going to make 2017 seem tame one of the reasons is we're going to see a war on a special counsel. We saw it against Cox of the Nixon era. We saw it against Ken Starr, investigation vulnerable. If you hire people who are Democratic donors, which they did, if you have people high up related to people who, who, uh, who are in the FBI, there is vulnerability. Starr had some vulnerability. Cox did not. Uh, you have the media. And how's the media playing it? The media was entirely against Nixon. The media was entirely for Clinton. The media is going to be mixed here because of Fox and because of the Wall Street Journal and others. You're going to have media on both sides. Entirely for Clinton. The media is going to be mixed here because of Fox and because of the Wall Street Journal and others. You're going to have media on both sides and say, we don't have your back anymore. Uh, when Bill Clinton, it was proven lied under oath and otherwise uh, came out, only Joe Lieberman was willing to stand up and say, hey, this is wrong. We can't stand for this. Uh, I think it's going to be potentially mixed in 2018 and a lot more supportive because folks like uh, Flake uh, and, uh, and God forbid, but likely Senator McCain and others may not be there in 2019 mm -hmm. in the Senate mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, Corker. You know, and then it comes down to the facts. And at the end of the day, if the facts are merely debate about obstruction, mm -hmm. I, I think you're going to have a fight over whether the special co counsel ran a fair investigation, whether what they found is a high crime and misdemeanor, uh, and that's not going to be helpful for a lot of the policy we were talking about we'd like to see, and it will certainly roil the elections. Mo, do the Democrats, um, have they ceded too much ground on policy and letting those things get done while they focus? Democrats, um, have they ceded too much ground on policy and letting those things get done while they focus call for impeachment, such as Tom Steyer has recommended? Um, the, to the latter question, yes. I don't think Democrats should be pursuing an all impeachment strategy. I, and I think that can be incredibly counterproductive at this point, especially at this point. Now, if the investigation plays out and we get a lot more information that starts pointing towards the direction of high crimes and misdemeanors, then let's have that conversation. But at this point, I think putting all your eggs in that basket is incredibly, uh, is incredibly dangerous. I would, uh, I think, question, challenge the premise of the first part of your question. Now, I don't think they are doing that. I think there are some Democrats out there who are doing that. Mm -hmm. But I think that challenge the premise of the first part of your question. Now, I don't think they are doing that. I think there are some Democrats out there who are doing that. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, you look at what's going on in the Senate, there are a lot of Democrats in the Senate who are standing firm uh, with this most recent tax fight. So Democrats are um, having the policy debates while also trying to keep the appropriate focus on the investigation. Uh, and people like Mark Warner in the Senate yeah. who's leading that charge over there in, in, I think, the appropriate manner. 
Marie, what about looking forward? And Michael, mm -hmm. I want you to comment on this too, which is um, the integrity of elections. Absolutely. And looking forward, and Michael, mm -hmm. I want you to comment on this too, which is um, the integrity of elections. Absolutely. And the, and, and the, and the alleged interference um, or the attempted interference by foreign powers trying to influence our elections. Are, are, is the United States doing enough to try to prevent that from happening in 2018 or 2020? I don't think we are. And, I, and part of that is because for President Trump, I think it's hard for him to separate out the idea that foreign powers are trying to meddle in our systems from the collusion investigation. They have DHS scan their systems with their most exhaustive security screening. I don't think the administration is taking seriously preventing it from happening in the future because it gets clouded with this administration is taking seriously preventing it from happening in the future because it gets clouded with this issue of collusion that they see as unfair. We should absolutely be doing more. And I think that 2018 and 2020, they need to focus on that. Michael, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, we absolutely look. Our elections are part of our critical infrastructure. Yeah. They should be defeated. Wisconsin even worse than Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and so Donald Trump won this election because he tapped into what the American people felt. He tapped into real emotions. Uh, and that's the lesson that should be learned from this. And we can overblow the Russia angle. All right. I'm going to write that down as best quote of 2017. <laughs> and it was right here on Fox News Sunday panel. It's time for a quick break. When we return, 2017 was a year of natural disasters from hurricanes in the Atlantic to deadly fires in the West. We'll check in on those recovery efforts with the panel next. <laughs> Is going to come, uh... We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. Some bonus time with the panel. Well, let me start with you and I want to ask you about um, the president and Charlottesville, because that seemed to be this uh, a big seminal moment of the year. And is that Charlottesville? Because that seemed to be this uh, a big seminal moment of the year. And is that continuing to drive the um, frustration, the disapproval of the president from Democrats mostly? Uh, I think it's a big part of it. I think it was one of the greatest missed opportunities of this administration. The way the president um, failed to seize the opportunity to unite the, himself, um, whether it was in his heart or just rhetorical blundering, mm -hmm. allowed, allowed himself to appear to the white nationalists, to the racists as their champion was a huge, hugely problematic thing that I think set uh, the tone and any hope he had of reconciling with a huge portion of the electorate and any hope he had of reconciling with a huge portion of the electorate, I think, ended right there. And yet, Michael, the president did seem to have his finger on the pulse of how people felt about the um, protests of the anthem at the NFL. And he really drove that home as a cultural issue. Yeah, that's bad for the country. Um, it's indefensible that we can't, as a nation, agree uh, that it's unacceptable for people in inner cities not to feel like the police can be there for them. It's also unacceptable, uh, it's unacceptable for people in inner cities not to feel like the police can be there for them. It's also unacceptable. Uh, um, and so we need to find a way as a nation to come together mm -hmm. to have a civic reawakening where we go forward. And there's no doubt uh, that the president has not uh, healed in some of those ways. There's no doubt that Barack Obama missed opportunities. Yeah. I mean, lighting up the, the White House in a rainbow flag the, the day that something that uh, was opportunities. Yeah. I mean, lighting up the, the White House in a rainbow flag the, the day that something that uh, was deeply disturbing to half of the country happened at the Supreme Court was not something that brought people together. And so we need to step back and figure out as a country, how do we unite? How do we have the type of civic reawakening that this nation has been able to have in the past? Uh, and if not, it's going to continue to get uglier. Right. Remember that civics, uh, the Pew study that said our, our civics education in America is a disaster. We've got to get on that in 2018. I do want to talk about another issue that's certainly on a lottery 16 minutes from an opiate overdose, that's what makes this an epidemic, and that's what I absolutely want to make sure we do first and foremost. Um, we also want to connect people to treatment. We don't want to keep resuscitating. We do first and foremost. Um, we also want to connect people to treatment. We don't want to keep resuscitating them. We want to have bridges to treatment. Also, as the nation's doctor, I think it's important that we address prescribing alternative to the fact that our life expectancy in the United States for the second year in a row has declined. Is America starting to come to grips with the scope and scale of the opiate epidemic? I think Americans are. The question is, are policy leaders 
likewise doing it and playing their role. There's a lot of debate about the proper role of government, and I think there's bipartisan agreement. The proper role of government here is to make sure that we regulate adequately so that there is not unlimited uh, addictive substances out there without people understanding, without doctors understanding uh, what they do and what the risks are. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of relief that can and needs to happen. That's one of the few bright spots in 2015 with Senator Portman and I think Senator Klobuchar put a legislation to happen. That's one of the few bright spots in 2015 with Senator Portman and I think Senator Klobuchar put a legislation together to try to help deal with the opioid crisis. There's more bipartisanship opportunity there. That's one of the rare issues I think any Democrat would work with President Trump on, notwithstanding the otherwise general. So synthetic fentanyl or, or others. Like, do you think that whether it's the CIA or ATF, DEA, like, is that needing to be more mobilized to deal with that problem? Absolutely. We really need a whole of DEA. Like, is that needing to be more mobilized to deal with that problem? Absolutely. We really need a whole of government approach here. When 91 Americans are dying every day, fentanyl, as you said, is so uh, addictive that even people, first responders, are having to be very careful when they're handling it. So we need a whole of government approach led by the White House, led by the Surgeon General, led by scientists, and yes, led by a bipartisan congressional effort to get funding for treatment, real long-term treatment, because we know this is a, you know, addicts need a long time in recovery and treatment. We need more and we need prevention and we need all of those things. They all require money. They require time. They require focus. Mm -hmm. And during an election year, it's hard to lose all of those things. But for the sake of our country's health, we have to stay focused on it. We absolutely do. It I is thought heartbreaking. that the president's speech in the East Room that day at the White House. Have to stay focused on it. We absolutely do. It I is thought that the president's speech in the East Room that day at the White House, where he talked about um, even his personal experience, you know, losing mm -hmm. his brother to addiction, was very powerful. One of his most powerful moments. And and of course, we can't leave without mentioning the dramatic natural disasters, uh, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma and Maria, and of course there was some mass shootings in Las Vegas um, and in Sutherland Springs. Um, and of course now, in all of these things though, there were moments where you realize that you know, humanity still exists. In all of these things though, there were 